Good morning. It rained. <laughs> the day after I decided to hack my yard and tear out our lawn and turn it into a home garden, we had all this dirt, and I spent eight hours moving dirt yesterday because I figure I've got calories, right? Sorry. <laughs> yeah, and so we have rivers of mud everywhere, and it was just like, yes, thank you. You're always, you're always potentially going to rain. And uh, there's this world of abundance that um, I'm going to talk about here. And we're going to take a little journey because um, A, lecturing's boring. Um, but if I also, on the other hand, had you guys just get up and start doing some exercises, they're completely out of context, right? So we're going to try to understand what it is that this guy is talking about and be able to use that with a frame of reference to improve our circumstances in life by improving our interface with life itself, okay? the operating system through which we see this world could have faulty programming. And our access to the abundant energy that's all around us might be what's limiting us, right? And not a lack of energy. So it's blocking that energy. And that's, you know, if there's one take home we're gonna have uh, in our time together here is there's an infinite amount of energy available to you in this universe right here and right now. So what's standing between you and it? And the answer is usually you, me, right? And so let's figure out how to get out of our own way and be able to tap into that abundance and tap into that free flow of chi so that we could go back and do what it was, hey, there it is, um, what it was that the ancients had set out to do. So we're gonna talk about this thing called Alchemy, uh, that's, that's my song, okay? I'm a Taoist priest. Um, I studied uh, both Eastern and Western alchemy for a very long time. And uh, the reasons people get into this game are far more important than the tactics they learn in the game, okay? And we're going to talk about that because both the East and the West have very strong traditions of alchemy, uh, biohacking, and all these things that we're talking about here. And so one of the things that we're going to uh, really stay on top of is playing with this definition of bulletproof, wherever you are, Dave, because the origin of the word bullet, what's a bullet? It's a projectile that's launched from an explosion of gunpowder that flies through a barrel and hits a person. And if that person is bulletproof or not, um, remains to be seen. But let's back up to the bullet. Gunpowder was discovered by accident by a Chinese alchemist who's looking for the elixir of immortality. And it literally blew up in his face. And so the Chinese thought to themselves, well, that was interesting. Um, he failed. Let's try a different formula. And, you know, they made fireworks and they started messing around. The Western guys said, hey, this is actually a really cool idea. We're going to take your country, right? <laughs> and so they jumped on it, right? And so that became kind of the basis of all modern warfare, imperialism, and all these things. But the root of this thing called gunpowder that we use far too often in our, um, in our quest to make people see it our way, came from the original inquiry into life itself and immortality and who the heck we are in relation to that. And I would put it to you that this dude who was looking for it in that way was off his rocker and he misread the text. The elixir is within your own consciousness and it's about finding it. And we're gonna take a trip there today. And what I'm going to do is we're going we're to kind of meander. We're going to stop. We're going to do a little meditation. We're going to do a little qigong. I'm going to keep going. And we're going we're gonna to kind of just take a journey uh, in this path with you guys. Because the Taoists had a very strong culture of, Im of immortality practice. Everyone wants to live forever. Um, their spouses might not want them to. 
right? And so what does living forever even mean? And so this tradition of the study of immortality has to do with us cheating death in a lot of ways, right? And wanting this thing called life to perpetuate, have the quality of life that also goes with that. And so one of the things we're going to learn in our Qigong practice, in our understanding of, of reality here, is finding where we can tap into the aspect of ourself that is immortal, that is eternal, and use that to understand who we are and have a frame of reference for all of the other stuff. I mean, you know, I just saw a dude flipping upside down in some sort of gyro thing over there. So the question is, what is that? And why are we, what are we hacking? What, where are we headed with this, right? Where is this path taking us? And there's nothing wrong with that. That's actually awesome. But once you have a frame of reference to understand what life's about, then it starts to make a little bit more sense. And so I want to kick it old school right now because, you know, uh, Dave, Dave is a good buddy of mine. Um, and he's on this, I love Bulletproof, right? But Bulletproof was being done a long time ago in a different way. Well, he referenced this, getting into this, right? The Shaolin monks, the story of the Shaolin monks was that there was just some monastery uh, with a bunch of monks that were sitting around meditating, okay? And there was a bunch of bandits that would come through their towns or their villages. And they'd rape, pillage, steal, do whatever they wanted, beat up the monks, chuck them aside, and go about their business and come back when you know, they knew there was gonna be more food. And so this kept happening over and over again. And this guy named Dhammo, or the Bodhidharma, who's the patron saint of Chan or Zen Buddhism, arrived from India and was like, hey, I'm, you know, I'm here to um, hang out with you guys. And they're like, we don't want you. So he went and shacked up in a cave not too far from the monastery and um, focused on melting the, the stone into glass with his mind. Um, and finally, they went in there and were like, hey, uh, why don't you come in the monastery? We'd like to talk to you. Right? And so he goes in there and he's like, well, well, you know, what are you guys praying for world peace, huh? They're like, yeah. It's like, so what happened yesterday when they came in and like, you know, abducted all the women and took all your food and beat you? We were praying for world peace. It just didn't work out yesterday, <laughs> right? And so he's like, all right, enough. And so he became the, the, the birth of this Shaolin movement where he's like, I'm going to teach you some exercises, the 18 hands of the Lohan, teaching them how to integrate their mind, their body, their chi, their breath, and their power so that they became the defenders of good. George Lucas, the story of the Shaolin Monastery and, and, and White Eyebrow and all the guys that like betrayed him and all, this is exactly the story of Star Wars. It comes from history, okay? Star Wars came from a, a mishmash of... of um, fables that came from China and Japan, but this is the main thing. The Shaolin monks were the Jedi Knights, right? Now, Shaolin Monastery in China is um, Chinese Disneyland. They just want your tourist dollars. The good guys were killed and they left. But the tradition has lived on. Uh, many of the great masters have made it to the States or to Europe and have kept on a living, breathing lineage. And it was about being bulletproof. It was about understanding the fundamental flow of energy and consciousness so that you can stand up and defend things that are worth fighting for. You can be a warrior for good in wherever, however you need to do that in your life. You could stand on your feet and say, ah, I understand you're trying to push GMO garbage into my family and have that stupid cartoon convince my kid that he needs this toy in that paper-wrapped hamburger. But I'm not going to fall asleep to that. I'm taking a stand. Right? And so this metaphor carries into our world because we live in a time right now where we're going to make the difference. Okay, the people who are stepping up and biohacking and stepping into who they are are the ones that are going to make the conscious decisions to say, I elect this world. I choose this. And that comes from gaining access to a certain part of your brain that you get more of with meditation. It comes from having the free flow of chi so that your energy is flowing, so that you have a force field because life is constantly firing arrows at you. 
How many people freaked out because they got wet walking to the conference center today? <laughs> right? Oh my God, it's water, right? But so if you have that resilience, you go, I got wet. Did it ruin your day? So you have that psychological resilience that comes with knowing where you come from and knowing that what just happened doesn't constitute a life-threatening crisis. It was just a little water, right? So how do you build that psychological cushion? How do you build that cushion of energy? And there's a very well-articulated practice of light body development that comes from the Buddhist and Taoist traditions. So I'm from a, a, a Yellow Dragon Monastery in China. I studied with, now, and, and let me qualify that by saying I studied with the one of two living masters who made it here and didn't get killed. And one was in uh, New York uh, who trained uh, um, the author of The Wandering Taoist and all these Kuang Sai Hung and then Sher Kei Lu came down to this side. So I got to study with like the guy. And he was a cranky guy. Because when you're not a monk and you grew up in Los Angeles and you're just some dude who's like, tell me, tell me this, they make you stand like this for hours and hours until you shut up and you deserve it, right? And so, you know, a lot of these guys are old school and they make you pay the dues. But what became abundantly clear was that he had the sauce. And there's very few of these guys that were teaching it. And it really is about developing your light body. It really is about working your cellular structure to get out of your way so that you become a light being. This isn't allegory. When you get better at this, you see rainbows in people's faces. You see energy. You feel energy. I'm a scientist. I was biology UCLA. I'm not making this stuff up. It was like, oh crap, that happened. And as a good scientist, you do not dismiss data because it doesn't fit your model. Well, I don't believe that. How many doctors have you guys encountered who, when you say something, say, well, I don't believe in that? We're not being scientists when we're saying that, right? So true scientist looks at everything. So we're going to do a quick practice right now, because I said we're going to kind of dance. Everyone put your feet on the ground. Sit up straight. Close your eyes. We're going to do a little bit of an entry into uh, what light body practice actually feels like. And it goes for years. I mean, Dave wasn't wrong. I mean, you do sit and stare at a rock for 20 years but you don't have to. There's other ways around this. Tip of your tongue, touching the roof of your mouth. What you're gonna do on the inhale, you're gonna breathe in, and, in nose and out nose. What you're gonna do on the inhale is you're gonna visualize puffy cloud of white light all around your body coming all the way into the depth of your being, into your spine, into your bone marrow, and condensing in fully on the inhale. And as you exhale, you're going to shine out in every direction like a light bulb. Bright, shiny light. Out in all directions on your exhale. Gather that light deep into your bone marrow, into every cell of your body on the inhale. So let's just take a couple minutes and, and ease into this real quickly and teach you guys how to drink from infinity. Slow, rhythmic breaths. In and out. Take two more breaths from wherever you're at and then gently, slowly open your eyes so I know you're back in the room. And you could do this anywhere. So a lot of people are like, oh, I do Qigong. Hold on, everyone at the park, look at me. Right? And you're like doing all this stuff. And they're like, oh, look at me, I look weird. And that's fine. I don't care about any of that. But if you're standing in line at the bank and 
they're taking too long. Drink in and out. Gather energy and dissipate it. As we work our ability to understand where energy truly comes from, we don't become so dependent on calories or on extracting energy from other people. Hey, hey, tell me you like my shirt. Tell me you like my shirt. Please tell me you like my shirt. I need that. Right? We live in this place where, where people are horizontally feeding on each other because they've forgotten how to drink from the correct axis. Okay? So there's two forms of immortality in the, you know, in the traditional practice. One of them's passing on your genes, being like, you know what, I made a lot of mistakes in my life, but my son, putting a lot into that guy, and I'm gonna be that dad, right? And so we do that, we carry on our bloodline. And that's the, the path of the householder. And the obvious other path is that of the ascetic. I'm gonna go shave my head, sit on a rock, and not get up until I realize who I am. I, being a glutton for punishment, did the very, very less traveled third road, so I have a six-month-old at home. <laughs> and it's a lot of work doing both because you are incredibly accountable for every single move that kid makes because they're watching you and emulating you and learning about the universe through you. Parents, you know, right? Every single move. And so either way, whether it's through good parenting or understanding where you come from and, and really taking that time to drink chi and, and, and go back to the source. Here's the missing ingredient in the market. Here's the missing ingredient in our society. Here's the missing ingredient in our crazy, hectic lives. Where's the consciousness? Who am I? Who just asked that question? Who just scanned that question and asked, who asked that question? Right? Driving way back into understanding who you fundamentally are was the baseline of every single one of these immortality practices, these biohacking practices from the ancient world. It's not, it's not about long life, it's about being a conduit for good. It's not about long life, it's about understanding who you are and being that vehicle, that vessel that understands you're greater than yourself and you're far greater than this body that will eventually decompose. And understanding that that doesn't matter because it's about immortalizing your consciousness. Immortalizing your consciousness. Waking up to your eternal self. And so there's a practice that does this within the Taoist framework, where you take this thing called Jing, which is that, I'm gonna be a daddy energy, right? That, that genetically, derived gift from your parents and your family line. So, and some people have it pretty good and some people, you know, woke up with asthma as a baby, right? And so we all come in with a different uh, kind of genetic bank account. But the first part in this is understanding how to not squander this. Not squander, I keep pointing to my monitor, not squander that. Um, and understanding how to cultivate that because that's the baseline of your energetic body. I personally found myself fatigued because we have a six-month-old baby. Who gets sleep when you have a six-month-old baby, right? And so I was like, oh my God, you know, I didn't make any room in my life for a lot of insomnia. And so as I started realizing I was more tired, I said, okay, monkey, no. You know better than this. So. I went into um, abstaining from ejaculation for 30 days. I feel great. There's practice, tantric pra practices that build on that. It doesn't mean you don't, you don't make love. It just means you don't. And it goes both ways. And you cultivate energy, and all of a sudden you're like, boom, hey, he's back, right? 
So what does that mean? What is it, how much of this do we squander every single day? Okay? A quick practice to hack into the Jing. Just take your palms, Mr. Miyagi style. Fingers down on the kidneys. Take nine breaths in nose and out nose and just feed your kidneys and your adrenals. Wherever you're at, just stop your day and juice up. Obviously, you can't do this one while driving. Huh? In LA, you can. Totally, you're not going anywhere. It's true. It's true. I do a lot of things in the car because it's not going anywhere. <laughs> yeah. So this is a wonderful way to just juice up your adrenals, fill up your kidneys. Quick way of restoring your energy. Here's the problem. How many people here do backcountry backpacking? Like get out there and actually cover some miles. Fantastic. Good crowd. Um, what happens when you get ahead of your breath? You have to stop. You pick up a pace, or runners, right? You pick up a pace that you can't sustain within five minutes, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, however tough you think you are. Eventually you're like, I need a break, right? But if you stay under your breath, you can go all day. So that's how we live our lives. We get ahead of ourselves and then we find ourselves complaining that we're too busy, too tired, so-and-so did this, blah, 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 because we are trying to catch our breath. So catch your breath and then learn not to squander your life force as you're rolling through your day so that you're not playing catch up the rest of the day, and then you go home, and you're exhausted, but then the kids are doing this, and then the stupid show is on, and your wife wants to watch it, and so, of course, I'm gonna spend time with my wife looking at a screen, right? And so all the things that we do that waste our time, we never get a chance to catch our breath. So the interface then where their energy is, and I'm sure most of you guys have heard the word chi, energy. This is plasma in the universe is the vital energy that runs through our bodies. You'd sit or stand. Inhale, exhale, nice and slowly. I want you to feel the thickness of the air between your palms. Make sure you tie it with your breath. Nice and slowly. Feel the connection between your palms and connect it with your breath and your mind. For some people, this just takes a couple seconds. For some people, it might take a couple weeks. But you will feel, and you can do this little thing, right? Just start moving them around and seeing if you feel something between your palms. Those are the early signs that you're starting to tap into chi. And some of you already have it. I could see some chi flowing in this room, right? This according to Chinese medicine, and, and, I, and I'm a doctor of Chinese medicine, I've spent a lot of time doctoring with qi. Changes people's lives. You just start moving the rivers and tributaries of the energy that flows through the body, and all of a sudden you're like, oh, I'm not that cranky, oh, that doesn't bother me anymore, right? But that qi needs to move. And it stagnates by us not moving, physically moving, you know, like doing things every day, like, hey, I'm actually, you know, a, a human in a body. And also it needs to move because we fixate and we crystallize and we get stuck. We get stuck in our way. And we get stuck in our way. We need to reinforce the reality that we thought we needed to bolster and create and perpetuate because if not, our ego faces annihilation. And then we drown. So your chi has to move because eventually that chi gets refined into shen or spirit or true consciousness.
the reason we're doing what we're doing is, I'm not telling you the reason. It's your reason. You've got to find it. Stop waiting for people to give you answers. That's against the rules. You can get wisdom from people, but you've got to tap into it so that you understand the basic metaphor of all alchemy is you look at the candle, the jing, or the essence, is the actual wax. The fire is the chi, and then the glow around the candle is the spirit or the shen. And so when we understand how to fundamentally run our system in a way that doesn't overburn, it's combustion, right? You want to burn it up by noon and complain about being tired all day? Bad math. So if you can stay under your breath and walk with your breath, you will understand how to flow with this. Because in Taoist alchemy, it's all about the fusion of the elements of fire and water. And I'm going to get into this by talking about the way, if you guys understand this, you will be able to change your entire life within the matter of days, and then in weeks you will start to see things sprouting. The fusion of fire and water becomes the fusion of heaven and earth, becomes the alchemical uh, magic in Taoism. The fire is related to our attention and our focus. Our focus is scattered in the modern world. How many things do you commit to in a given day that you can reasonably get to, and how many things do you jam into that timeline thinking maybe I'll get to it but stress you out, right? That's called time compression syndrome, and we all suffer from it, okay? And how about saying, you know what? I'm going to be a vegan, and I'm going to lose 20 pounds, and I'm going to do 100 burpees a day, and I'm going to do that every day for three weeks. And then four days into it, you've moved on because your focus just... That happens when you don't have a center. Because the other side of that, the water, is the intention or the willpower, which is the energy we have to drive that, which comes from our jing, which comes from our ability to emanate and manifest. And we spend it because we're not focused. Think of a, think of a garden. And I got, this is my garden right here, right? And I've got room for maybe five plants here. What are they going to be? My wife better be in there, right? How about my kid? How about my career, my exercise, and, you know, my, my, my training? Okay, let's just put those five in there. And I'm like, well, I also wanted to be an astronaut. You know, I was thinking, I'm going to go hike the Austrian Alps. I got this, I got that. You know, I'm just sort of loading all of these, these plants in a plot of land that can't sustain it, let alone the weeds, the things that have snuck in. And then we have this amount of water trying to water these 20 or 30 plants, wondering why they're dying on the vine, why things are withering. So if things aren't happening in your life, if you're not a manifester, Look at how many things you've committed to and look at how much chi or vitality or energy you have and see how you can reconcile those. See how you can line up your power with your focus. Magic happens. People think I'm insane. I make things happen like, like a madman. And I'm home hanging out with my Labradors and playing with my kid every evening. Why? It's because I don't get up and check email. I get up and do it. Right? Because I know what my task is that day. Because as we start fusing that, and my, my tradition is a steam school. Literally, you drop the water down, you steam it up to your third eye, you let it drop, and then you're, you're using the serotonin, melatonin, dimethyl, tryptamine access to wake up the body and have super immunomodulation and activate your light body. And there's all sorts of wonderful, juicy stuff you can do with that. Um, once you get into a, a, a dedicated Qigong practice. But here's how most people do Qigong. Oh, yeah, 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 I do Qigong. I, you know, I took a class, you know, once in a while, you know, when I'm really stressed out and, you know, thinking I shouldn't smoke this cigarette, I'll run out and do this Qigong. If you don't do it every day, you're not tilling your field, right? Or same people, it's like, oh, you know, I went to this great yoga class. I'm like, okay, well, is that, is that your yoga practice? You go give money to Lululemon and you show up at a social thing once in a while? Or do you have a yoga practice 
on your own? Do you use yoga as part of your operating system? Most of us have this desktop, and there's a million windows open on it. And then all of a sudden you're like, oh, system's getting tired, uh, windows are hanging up, I'm really exhausted, I don't know what to do. Oh, double click meditation icon. <sighs> right? And then you move on, all your windows are still open. Oh, yoga, okay, great, hey, look at me, right? And, and so, you, so we monkey around opening all these apps while leaving all of the other apps open instead of understanding that yoga is supposed to be your operating system. Union, understanding that there's a framework as things come in. So you say, how does this sit with me? How do I feel right now? Oh, you know what, I'm a little too tired to say yes to that. Hey, let's go get a drink after this. That sounds great. I'm tired and I work hard and I deserve it, right? By saying yes to a drink with you, I just said no to Abel James who drove here with me. <laughs> um, my wife, my kid, my commitments, my practice, and all these things. I just compressed a bunch of things and stressed them out on my timeline because I impulsively said yes. Monkey, no, right? And we do that all the time, right? And that's why they call it the monkey mind. We jump and we stay outside of our body. We stay outside of our focus. Oops, I shot you guys with a laser. Um, so we're gonna talk about the anatomy of consciousness real quickly. My self-conscious identity is my ego. It's my interface with reality. It's my interface with the universe. And it's the storefront that I have. Ha ha, Pedram's this Taoist guy who's also kind of funny but does all this other stuff and you know, makes jokes and whatever. I have created a, a, an external persona to be able to interface with people in crowds because I'm actually an introvert. And I love to just sit on my ass and meditate because it feels good, right? But this is part of who I am. I'm of service, I love people. So who's your persona? And where are the friction points of your self-conscious identity getting banged up in your reality and how can you soften your, your definition of self so that you're not taking hits going down the road all the time, right? Look at your storefront, because that, guys, is where we leak most of our energy, is all the energy we put into trying to bolster who it is that we say we are, because I'm gonna prove dad wrong, right? There's a lot of energy we leak. We're not lacking energy. Your subconscious mind, and this is where all the like manifestation trippers hang out. It's like you just, you know, it's like this thing and you embed it in this like pond and then things happen. So you make suggestions into your subconscious field. Works, works really well. But what they're missing is the connection with your superconscious mind or your higher self. Whatever you want to call that, call it the universe, call it God, call it Tao, none of that matters. Those are just words. We all live in these bodies. We all share a common existence together and we fight over the word. It's ridiculous. Whatever that means to you, if you don't have a connection with that, then the rest of it goes crazy because this is how it interacts. So every time I look down, I blast your ears. The superconscious mind will feed directly into the subconscious as does, does this thing work? No. As does the subconscious feed into the self-conscious and the self-conscious into the, okay, so this stuff on the right is us making suggestions to our subconscious mind, which then feed back into our self-conscious identity, okay? That's all law of manifestation, you know, all that kind of stuff. But the influence from the superconscious dropping into the subconscious is why we meditate. I want to have a Bentley. I want to have that house. I want like six girls in my jacuzzi. I want this. I want that. All these wants that are being leveraged by things that are coming from outside of you. Look, I spent the first 20 years of my life studying what desire is and how it's the root of all suffering in Buddhism. And then I start well.org and I gotta learn about things and I'm like, okay, I gotta look at marketing 101. And basically what marketers do is find out what your desires are, find out what your weak point is and judo flip you onto the ground and take your wallet. That's a reality we live in. I, I'm not smart enough to watch TV. 
Because if I'm too tired and I come home at the end of the day and I sit there and plop in front of the TV, I'm going to talk, turn to my wife and say, you know, I, I think I want a Kawasaki jet ski. <laughs> that's going to make me feel like a man. Because I'm obviously not man enough, right? And so that's the world we live in. So if you're taking that punishment, if you're taking that barrage of stuff that's trying to leverage you into behavior that isn't even identified on this garden, and all of a sudden, you're like, you know, you're watering over here, playing with your kid, and all of a sudden, like, something happens. You're like, oh. Now your kid has problems at school. And you can't figure out why. You didn't even water the garden. You didn't water the, the, the place. And so that's what we do. And so ideally, and this is, you know, this is gold standard, but that's where I stand for all of you, is what you want to do is link up so that your super conscious mind is constantly feeding information, hi John, information and uh, energy into your subconscious, which is then helping you move through life like a hot knife through butter. This is not my energy that is speaking, it is the energy of the universe speaking through me. And that's not saying I'm some sort of like godsend dude, right? All of you, be a channel for your greater self and get the heck out of the way and you won't know exhaustion, okay? You will learn to refine your jing into shen. That's what you do, that's what you do with tantra. It's like you bring it up and you turn it into spirit. It's the only game in town. If you look at all of the ancient traditions, it's about taking the essence of who we are and our biological drive and transforming it into self-realization. Because from there, you're truly bulletproof. You understand how to manage your energy. So we're gonna do a quick primer on this and I'm gonna give you guys homework immediately. Because if you do this, and I expect you to, within a week your life will start changing. And this is the, this is the baseline stuff, okay? So we're not, you know, we're not talking about levitation. That stuff's not even interesting or important to me. When you get people in there like, ooh, hey, follow me, I'm the great guru, run the other way. If you had a certain amount of body burden, the colors got messed up on the slide, and then you had some stress, a little stress, and you have all that vitality left over, you're doing pretty well. But if your body burden goes up, say this morning, instead of having my green smoothie with my protein and some herbal tonics, I had Dunkin' Donuts my body burden just went and I got more stress because I didn't do my slides or I forgot about this or forgot about that because I mismanaged my life. The stress overwhelms my system and I have very little vitality left. Okay? Does this make sense? Right? Basic math. You, your body has a cushion of vitality and when you give that up is when disease, stress, breakdowns, and all these things start to happen. Okay, where does this energy go? Man, it takes a lot, of, a lot of juice to run this shop. Okay, there's a lot of energy happening all around. There's dissolution. I have cells dying so fast right now. Oh, and I just made a bunch more. Thank you. That's all energy, right? So your body needs energy, and you need to get out of the way of that energy, because then you have this scale where eventually if your body burden is high and you're stressed out, you have no vitality. And when you are bankrupt in vitality, you are bankrupt in health and you are bankrupt in enthusiasm. And then you don't even have the motivation to be able to help yourself anymore, right? How many people know people like that in their lives, right? They just, they, uh, it's like you're like, oh my God, they're hopeless. I don't even know where to start. So we're going to talk about where you guys can hack this and fix it right now. It's the wheel of vitality, and what we're gonna do is we're gonna pick one thing in every category. So diet. I just converted, we just tore out my backyard and, and put in six raised beds, and I just moved seven cubic uh, something, uh, pounds of the lot, a mountain of dirt from the front yard into the backyard with a wheelbarrow, and I said I'm gonna do it myself because I could use some sunshine. So my kid knows how to garden. We're going yard to table. What is it 
in your life? One thing. You have to tell me. What's the one thing you know you ought to be doing better in diet? Say it's like, I should just eat breakfast. One thing in your life that you can change in diet right now and start doing it today. Start with the biggest thing and just commit to that one thing in diet and change it. Because what I'm doing is, is not asking you guys to put energy into anything new. What I'm gonna do is help you guys become more efficient and gain energy out of each of these departments so that you can reinvest it in your future. And I promise you, if you make that one hack in diet, there will be a tremendous amount of energy that's liberated in your life immediately. I mean, within a week. One thing, start there. Same thing with exercise. Dave, Dave sent me this picture of him this morning. Um, guy's a beast. One thing is it, do you sit too much? Do you need to walk? Part of my gong, part of my 100 day practice right now is I don't go to bed until I got 5,000 steps, period. So there's nights where I you know, flew in from New York or something where I'm pushing the baby stroller around at night, listening to a book on tape, getting in my steps and getting in my reading because a deal's a deal. What one thing can you do in your exercise that's going to loosen up or unhinge some of that energy? Same thing with sleep. I mean, Dave talks about this a lot. You have a lot of smart people here that are going to be talking today who've been talking all weekend about how to hack things. Pick something that makes sense to you and do it. And don't do it in your head. Don't think about doing it. Don't say, ooh, that was interesting. Start right now. That's the biggest disease of humanity, is the consciousness is here and now. And we go, oh, that's cool. I'll think about that. And then tomorrow, this garden's got a bunch of weeds. And we say, there's another garden over here. Maybe we could put some other plant. And we just forget. We don't move on. What one thing in sleep can you change? Write it down. Is it no TV at night? We try to do candlelight at night, no artificial light. Why? Because it helps the baby sleep, it turns out. Why? Because he's from nature. And we spend so much time bringing him out of nature within the first couple years, then we wonder why they have behavioral problems and we wonder why they trip out. Keep him close to nature. And then mindset. What are you doing for your stress management? If you don't have an active stress management protocol in place, and you just have a little stress icon on your desktop that you're gonna double click when it's already hit the fan, too late. What do you do every morning to build a cushion of vitality so that you are not a stressed out person? What do you do every day so that you can offset the damage that comes at you all the time? I just crossed the street and some diesel truck just gassed me and I just got mercury, oops. There's certain things that are just out of your hands. How do you hedge your bet, right? We live in a toxic world and we're looking at all these diseases right now and going, oh, well, that's, that's why we have autism. No, 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 we found out why we have autism, it's this. That's all nonsense, it's all of it. All of this barrage of stuff that hits you from every angle is arrows hitting your force field. And the Shaolin monk is like, uh-uh. Uh-uh. Bam. Right? Because I'm on a mission, right? I'm not going to sit there and take arrows all day and just be like, oh, yeah, I'm tired. That's how we live. So how do you go forward? How do you step up and be that Shaolin warrior? Is you eke out your energy from all of these departments and then start doing a personal practice and waking up to who you are and you pay that vitality forward. Because what happens is if you don't raise your consciousness and use that energy to wake up, to be more of who you can be, right? God, the army hacked that. Um, be, be all you can be. Um, if you can't do that, then you will go to a place of self-sabotage. Because what happens, it's a famous picture. <laughs> what happens 
when I have a certain amount of motions, of discomfort that I'm feeling, and I sedate myself because I don't want to feel them, and then I cruise through life. And then I take away those sedatives and I start increasing my energy is I also start feeling worse. And those things that I was running from become louder and harder to deal with so that I bring my energy back down. I will do something foolish. I will self-sabotage. I will go back to that place of low energy because it's more comfortable because I don't want to feel the things that I'm uncomfortable feeling. You guys see this happening in people in your lives? Are you guys guilty of this? We all do it. And the way you stop that is to raise your consciousness and wake up to it. Because it's not a lack of energy. It's all the garbage we carry around every day that we are unwilling to look at that sits there and takes charge in our energetic fields. It's the memes or the mommy said this or daddy said that stuff that we've left unresolved. And so what we do is we say, uh, you know what, screw it, march forward, right? And we just fight and fight and fight until one day we're exhausted and there's not enough coffee or, or super tonics or any sort of hack that seems to be working is because our frame of reference wasn't about abundance, it was about running away from ourselves. And so I caution you on that because the monk's way is the way of self-examination. Why do I feel that way? Why does that make me uncomfortable? And I promise you, when you address that there's a tremendous amount of energy that's liberated on the other side of any one of the hundreds of thousands of things that we hang on to all the time, okay? So, just, how do you recapitulate? How do you go back and scan through what is bothering you and clear the things that you've been dragging on for years, decades? that are the root of your fatigue, that are the root of your foul moods, and are feeding the hungry ghost. So we're going to do a practice right now. That's awesome. So we're going to do a practice right now um, where If you were to think of a certain thing that bothers you, like a time in your timeline. I don't have a slide, but I do have hands. Here we go. So this is the present moment, and something happened right here in the timeline. And so here you go, positive energy all the way through. Some event happens, flip polarity, negative energy. And every time someone speaks loudly at Starbucks and is rude to the clerk, you feel like you're anxious and you're really upset and you can't figure out why because that guy is being a jerk, but you realize it was your father who raised his voice and you were never good enough, right? And so if you could trace back to when that polarity flipped, and what you do, and this is kind of the newest stuff in psychology, is you go back to that person at that age, at that time, you, here's me, eight-year-old Pedram. Freeze the frame in your mind. Show them that it's safe, and then come in and say, how would I rather this look? And start reframing and repatterning. There's a Hawaiian practice called Honoponopono, which I find very powerful, where you go in there and say, I love you, I love you, please forgive me, I'm sorry. And then you heal the original event. You go back along the timeline, you find these things, and you start plucking these things that are energy parasites out of your timeline, along your psyche, along your consciousness. Then you watch 
how the energy from all of that starts to liberate. And the less energy you feed it by resisting it because now it's healed, the more energy you have available to you. That's a longer practice than I have to teach right now. But if you get what I'm saying, the important part of this is to freeze the frame. Because with the frozen frame, the stress goes away. What happens is when you go back to a moving image and there's the stuff, the stuff that traumatized you, it's still moving, so it's still traumatic to your younger self. And if you freeze the frame, then you could go in and look at it objectively and be like, look, I'm here, I'm your older self, I'm here to help, let's fix this. And so you could do tapping therapy, you can do honoponopono, you could pray, you could meditate, you could cleanse it with white light. There's a million ways to do this. But if you don't hack your timeline, you're still carrying it around. And you're trying to carry it into tomorrow, hoping there's more of something to help you get more energy and edge tomorrow because you've got all of yesterday in your back pocket. And it gets heavy. It gets really, really heavy. So you want to understand Qigong, you want to understand alchemy, you've got to understand how to get the hell out of your own way and stop carrying around the past. Because the alchemists talk about a concept that in modern terms we call impedance. That's why we use gold for wires. It's how much energy do you lose as you're conducting, okay? And so these guys are sitting there trying to convert lead to gold. And the guy who created gunpowder blew himself up. That was ironic, right? He was trying to convert lead to gold. And what he didn't understand is that the lead is the stuff from your timeline. The lead is the stuff from your history, from your past, that you are to convert to gold so that you can be a hyper-conductive individual. So this chi, this refinement of chi can work. Okay? So turning lead to gold is nonsense outside of your body. When you do it inside your body, then everything falls into, in, falls into perspective. And everything that we do here in this conference, in all the seminars and the workshops that you do, fall in line because then you're not a hungry ghost and you've learned where to drink. In Taoism, we line up with the earth underneath us, the sun, the moon, and then we find key constellations, like we go straight to the Big Dipper, the Pleiades, and we lock in, we meditate on all of the celestial moving being, the bodies in the air, and connect on the ground, because what we're doing is we're locking in to the present moment of where the universe is and how the universe is moving. Because what happened three minutes ago or three seconds ago is gone. And so the universe moves and time moves. So if you are riding your brake pads, trying to stay in yesteryear or some other time, and not understanding that the living, breathing moment is here and now, you'll never have chi and vitality in your life. Moving into the now means learning to drink from infinity. Okay? And everyone uses the word now all the time. You know, I think Eckhart did a very good job. I think a lot of these people have done a very good job. So, what does it mean to step into the now? How can you stop your day as it's happening and just go, okay, center up. Boom, boom, boom. Got it, cool. I'm gonna go do this, or I'm right back with you, right? Check in with yourself. Understand that as the universe is moving and you're not moving with it and stuck in different time zones, you're going to get tired. You're going to lose energy. And a lot of, you know, the guys, I spent a lot of time in India uh, hanging out with some very weird people, um, trying to figure out their shtick, right? Like, you're, you're in a boneyard, right? And, and, and the guy is, he looks like that. He looks like that. And so you let go of all judgment and be like, what's this guy tripping on? And he's learning about the practice of dissolution and letting go. 
the impermanence of everything and how the, the living, breathing moment is moving at all times. And in doing so, we don't cling to this thing called physical immortality because we realize that when we have gnosis, we've immortalized our consciousness. We've woken up to who we really are, and none of that, none of that matters. None of that matters. Whether you take your body with you or not is inconsequential. Okay? So this is key 16 in the Tarot, called the Tower. And this is what happens in society all the time is we build this tower to defend our self-conscious ego. We try to be this rock, and we create a storyline. And I've done that here, and now time has moved on, and moved on, and moved on. And the further reality is, from the reality I'm trying to bolster, the more polarity I've created the more charge there is. And guess what happens when you eventually keep hang on, hanging on to this and this rubber band keeps stretching? Is you get a bolt of lightning, you get a static discharge that destroys parts of your life. Oh hey, cancer diagnosis. Oh hey, big car accident. Oh hey, wife just left you, right? When you have been stuck in your tower not realizing that dissolution is the name of the game, that you are more than your physical body and you need to understand that in a visceral way so that you don't cling to things that are not real. Let's all stand up, please. So we're gonna do a little exercise here. And you can do this pretty much anywhere and you'll look a little more weird than the other one. Let your feet shoulder width apart, hands out in front of you like you're hugging a tree. Bend your knees slightly Tuck your pelvis up so you don't want your pelvis completely tucked in and you don't want your butt sticking out, right? So just tuck it up a little bit and drop into your stance. Tip of the tongue touching the roof of the mouth. Breathing down to a point which is about three fingers below your navel as if you have a balloon down there. Inflate that balloon on the inhale and deflate it on the exhale while keeping your hands nice and soft in front of you. The old allegory of the Taoist master, the Tai Chi master, who was teaching this was he had a pet bird that would sit on his finger, and his friend said, aren't you afraid you would, your bird is going to fly away? He's like, I give him no ground to push off of. So just stay completely empty in there. And what you want to do is as you breathe, start feeling the space between your palms and your arm and your torso and just hang out and feel it and be with it. So there's a tremendous amount of power that you can harness just here between your body and your palms. Why are we saying we're tired? If you, some of you guys, I see your elbows are up. Let your elbows drop a little bit. So your elbows are down but your hands are at your chest level, so you don't let energy leak out this way. So just kind of contain it. Yeah, there you go. And for those of you who want to do some bang, if you know how to kegel, kegel up from your perineum and cross your eyes in and up to your third eye on your in-breath and then let it go on your out-breath. Pull up your perineum, pull up the chi, straight up the center line to your third eye. Remembering to breathe nice and low, keeping the energy flowing through your body, not having rigidity and letting the breath soften your stance. I'm just gonna do this for a few more seconds. You could do this anywhere. And when you connect up with this, then you connect up with the core of your own bioelectric body. You connect up with the core of who you are right now. And you breathe into that. 
Then you check in with life. Okay, so breathe out your mouth. Just feel this again, in and out. Feel the space between your palms. Fuzzy, tingly, warm, just shout out what you feel. Ball. Can't hear you. Squishy. Thick. Just keep them coming. What are you feeling? Tingly. Ball. I'm not making this up. This isn't me saying, hey, you need to believe in this thing called chi. Trust me. It's yours. You're the one feeling it, right? So there's a big difference between belief and experience, and you guys are experiencing your own energy, your own chi. So here's just a couple parting thoughts, is do this sequentially. This pyramid wasn't built from the top down. It was built from the bottom up. Pick your four things, you guys, and start hacking into diet, exercise, sleep, and mindset, and start to develop an attitude, a culture of mastery to understand who you are in the context of all this so that you have a frame of reference, right? So you have a frame of reference to be able to go from there. So we weren't able to cover the actual tactics. I have meditations and videos and Tai Chi videos that are all free for you guys. If you text Pedram to 58885, um, I got a bunch of free stuff for you. The stuff isn't, like people go, well, will you teach me this set? Will you teach me this one? None of that matters. What matters is your orientation so you understand it. I can teach you the most amazing stuff in the world, but if you don't understand how to get out of your own way, you're gonna keep chasing stuff, okay? So I hope that helped. Um, the, this discourse doesn't usually happen in the Qigong world because everyone's trying to sell more energy. And it's nonsense. You have plenty of energy. What are you doing with it? Where are you bottling it? What's the problem? Okay? So I'm over time. I got to go. Thank you very much, you guys.